Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Today's lesson is on hypersleep and longevity in space. The space environment is an extremely harsh one. There are many who question whether human beings can survive these conditions at all. We are going to evaluate the dangers of living in space, including radiation and low gravity effects, and the possibility of suspended animation and other technologies that could not only help us colonize new star systems, but also allow those back on Earth to live longer, healthier lives. The media has been going crazy lately over the possibility of visitors from another star system visiting our Earth. Large objects have been sighted, visually and on radar and sonar, traveling through the air and under the water. These appear to be able to fly at speeds exceeding that of our fastest Earth-based technology without seeming to create sonic booms or atmospheric shockwaves. The jury is out on what these unidentified aerial phenomena, formerly called unidentified flying objects, or UFOs, might actually be. Many assume them to be visitors from another star system. I'm always surprised that this is the only presumptive origin. If these phenomena are real, and these are advanced craft from somewhere else, we must also entertain the possibility that they are advanced technology from a nation competing with the United States, though this is unlikely. The United States spends more on its defense than almost all other nations on Earth combined. It is more likely to be a secret U.S. project studying our own military's reaction to unknown threats than that a competing nation chose to showcase their secret technology around an American strike force. If we are entertaining extreme hypotheses, we must also consider advanced technology from a more ancient Earth-based civilization, human or otherwise, that chose to keep its location secret from the Earth's human inhabitants. This civilization could use advanced technology to shield itself from detection, on the surface of the Earth, perhaps in some remote location, or under the oceans, where we have not yet explored even 10% of the depths, or on the Moon or another body in the solar system, shielding their ships from visual and infrared detection by some unknown technology. Or they could be visitors from another dimension, parallel to ours. Another Earth, subtly different from ours, coming to learn why we haven't advanced as far as they have. Or time travelers, coming back to understand their ancient ancestors, perhaps knowing that nothing they do in the past can change the future they know. But if they are from another star system, how did they get here? Assuming that the warping of space-time is forever beyond practical technology, by what method would they come to observe us? And how long would it take them? Nothing with mass can accelerate itself to even light speed, as the mass generated by the kinetic energy would make the ship harder and harder to accelerate further. Even with infinite power, edging us ever closer to the speed of light. We would never quite reach it. Time on the ship would slow, more and more, as we asymptotically approach the speed of light. But time at the base we launched from would continue at its own pace. We would come home to find all of our family long dead, and the organizations we worked for completely changed. And they would find us archaic remnants of long-forgotten technology. The nearest star system to Earth is Proxima Centauri, and it is 9 quadrillion 460 trillion 790 billion kilometers from Earth. This is 4.25 light years or 1.30 parsecs. I don't like to measure distances in parsecs. A parsec is a measure created by using an angle of parallax. Parallax is the effect of moving your point of reference and observing how much a distant object appears to move relatively. It is how our eyes derive depth perception. The distance between our eyes on our face creates the parallax. The Earth's journey from one side of its orbit to the other, six months apart, creates the parallax astronomers use to calculate parsecs. And it is a measurement derived when the distance of one astronomical unit, the Earth's distance to the Sun, subtends an angle of one arc second. An arc second is one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. This gives us 206,265 AU, which turns out to be 3.26 light years. I prefer to just use light years, 
as all the aliens we meet will almost certainly be familiar with that measure. Let's say that we want to visit Proxima Centauri, so we can look at its planets. Proxima is a red dwarf star with only 12.5% the mass of our Sun, but its density is 33 times that of our Sun. Because its cooler temperature reduces thermal expansion, Proxima is only one-seventh the diameter of our Sun, which is about 1.5 times the diameter of Jupiter. The surface temperature of Proxima is about 3,100 Kelvin, while the temperature of our Sun is about 5,778 Kelvin. This makes our Sun much brighter in the visible light spectrum. Proxima Centauri is, in fact, only 0.0056% as luminous as our Sun in visible light. Its total luminosity, however, is 0.17% that of our Sun, with 85% of its radiated power in the infrared. All these numbers make Proxima Centauri a red dwarf. Proxima has at least three known planets, labeled B, C, and D, while the label Proxima Centauri A is reserved for the star itself. The first discovered planet was Proxima B. Proxima b orbits at a distance of 0.05 AU. This is much closer than the orbit of Mercury. But because Proxima a is cooler than our Sun, it is still within the habitable zone for temperature, meaning liquid water could exist on the surface. A year on Proxima b would take only 11.2 Earth days, but anything living there would have probably evolved from subsurface single-celled organisms and would need to live in underground lakes and rivers of water, or in caves, because stars like Proxima A are flare stars. This means they generate huge bursts of radiation and solar flares. These flares would almost certainly strip away any atmosphere the planet had, leaving the surface unprotected. Anything on the surface of Proxima B would need to be very radiation resistant, or far underground. It would be interesting to duplicate the effect of these pulses on the planet's surface, here in a laboratory on Earth, and see if our most radiation-resistant organisms, the bacterium Deinococcus radiodurans, for instance, or perhaps the animals known as tardigrades, could survive. It is possible that if Proxima Centauri b had a massively powerful magnetic field, it might be shielded somewhat from its sun's flares. But it is also likely that Proxima b is tidally locked. This means that one side would always face the star, just like one side of the moon always faces the Earth. That would create a hot side and a relatively cold side, with a more temperate zone in between. The other two planets that we know circle Proxima A are Proxima C, which is 1.5 astronomical units from Proxima A, and appears to be a super-Earth, which means a rocky planet more massive than Earth, but smaller than Uranus or Neptune which are 14.5 and 17 times the mass of Earth, respectively. Proxima C is calculated to be 6 to 8 times more massive than Earth. It takes 5.3 Earth years for Proxima C to orbit Proxima A. The giant planet Proxima C should have an average temperature of 39 Kelvin, making it inhospitable to all known Earth life. A super-Earth orbiting a small star at a considerable distance is fairly easy to detect. And finally, we come to Proxima D which is only 0.029 AU away from Proxima A. These names are out of sequence, because while D is the closest known exoplanet to Proxima A, it was discovered last. Its mass of only 0.26 Earth's mass and close proximity to the star made it harder to detect. Proxima D should have an average temperature of about 360 Kelvin, which is about 87 Celsius. This is a toasty 189 Fahrenheit for my American friends almost boiling, so it would be hard for Earth life to survive on the surface there. If it were bigger, it might have oceans to protect life, but its small size makes that almost certainly impossible, and the flares from Proxima Centauri A would be even stronger when they hit, about three times stronger than those hitting Proxima B, in fact. The James Webb Space Telescope should be able to tell us a lot more about planetary systems like Proxima Centauri since it sees in the infrared that is invisible to our eyes. This is the closest star to us, and if some hardy life form from Proxima Centauri wanted to come see what we were all about, and their ship was moving at the same speed as Voyager 1, 
an amazing 17 kilometers per second. It would take them 73,775 years to get here. That's not very practical. If they could somehow propel themselves one-third the speed of light, it would still take 197 years for them to reach Earth. Let's work with that number. The average human lifespan today is about 73 years. A little longer for women, about 76 years, and a little less for men, 71 years. But average includes a lot of accidents and preventable diseases. The maximum human lifespan seems to be a little more than 100 years. While one human is proven to have lived to be 122 years old, and many scientists believe that within this century, an age of 120 years will become much more common. We know there are genetic factors that predispose to a long or short life, and knowing these factors, combined with the ability to make genetic adjustments in living cells using technology like CRISPR, we will soon be able to cure those afflicted with a disease that causes rapid aging, like progeria, and we will be able to offset some of the consequences of aging. Muscle wasting can be reversed by myostatin antibodies. The life-preserving effects of exercise and a calorie-restricted diet can be triggered with molecules like nicotinamide mononucleotide. Bone loss can be prevented with exercise and medications like alendronate. Aging is coming to be seen more and more as a disease. As a matter of fact, in the ICD-11 code, old age is listed as a disease and a cause of death. If you think about it, this makes sense. The cells of our favorite animal friends are almost indistinguishable under the microscope from ours. But a mouse only lives to be about two years old under ideal circumstances, while a dog will live to be nine years old, a horse 30 years, and a human maybe 75. A Galapagos tortoise, 177. We might be tempted to think that it's because the tortoise are reptiles that they live so long, but whales have been found that seem to be 200 years old. Science will allow humans to live longer and longer, until eventually, humans will be practically immortal. Barring some extinction event, or perhaps a new inquisition. No one expects the celestial inquisition, by the way. But even a lifespan of 200 years would make a journey of 197 years untenable. We must, therefore, find a way to hibernate, to put ourselves in some type of stasis that further slows the aging process. There are animals that seem to do this. We all know that squirrels and bears hibernate through the winter so they can survive food scarcity. Exactly the same problem that would affect every space traveler. The tonnage of food and water required to take 100 people to Mars would absorb a significant amount of available payload. And you'll need food when you get there until you can develop crops and other food sources. We cover all of this in the lesson Journey to Deimos. Once you watch that, you will understand that bringing enough food to last centuries is nearly impossible. One solution is to recycle everything and have bioreactors, where organic waste is recycled into usable sustenance. Genetically engineering blue-green algae to produce more nutrients for humans would also help us recycle carbon dioxide and would contribute to the diet. Insects are very hardy, fast-growing, and an excellent protein source, a little hard for most people to get used to. The possibility of vat-grown meat is becoming a reality. But then we must worry about boredom. Even if you have an AI-produced entertainment system, constantly adjusted to your preferences, there is a limit to how long sentient beings can stay sane in a confined environment. Now there is no reason to assume that human limits are alien limits, and perhaps we could use a combination of technologies to suspend our metabolism, cool our bodies to just above freezing, and suppress the activity of the brain, and stay in what the science fiction novels usually call hypersleep for decades. If there are visitors from other stars on Earth today, they have either transitioned to immortal biological or mechanical bodies, discussed in this lesson, or a small group of dedicated scientists have climbed into a hypersleep chamber, slipping into a deep blackness, knowing that when they arrive, the world they left has been irrevocably changed, and that the people they knew will be long gone, and that, after awakening at a new world, they will spend the rest of their lives observing and reporting back to a world with only historical memory of whom they were. Something to think about.
Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help support us on Patreon if you can. We appreciate you. At Astro Proterra.